And I think engineering is not a solo job. It's definitely a team effort. And it's a team of whether it's consultants or contractors, it's everybody coming to the table and working together and figuring out the best way possible to solve the problem. There's never one answer. There's definitely a plethora of answers out there, but it's working with the people you have, harnessing their potential, and then getting to the solution. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's episode of Engineering Greatness, an original podcast series produced by the American Concrete Institute, a podcast series for young professionals by young professionals. My name is Faraz Sharston, and I just graduated recently, actually, with my Master of Applied Science from Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. And I'm here today with a fellow colleague also from the Great White North, and my co-host is Matthew Allen. I'm going to give you the floor to introduce yourself here, Matt. Hi, everybody. As Faraz mentioned, my name is Matt Allen. I'm a structural EIT with Dillon Consulting Limited, and I'm still a master's student, still in the trenches here, doing structural engineering at the University of Manitoba. And as you mentioned, I was born and raised up, up north here in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. So thanks, everybody, for joining today. Uh, so let's get started. Raj, do you want to tell me a little bit of how you landed in civil engineering and your path to getting there? Absolutely. So I think just from like even high school, um, I was very close to my aunt and she's a civil engineer herself. And uh, she kind of really uh, led the path for me to kind of want to explore my career path in, in civil engineering. And then I went, it was kind of natural for me because even when I was younger, I always went to Dalhousie University in terms of, you know, like rock climbing camp and all the March Madness kind of events. So it was, it was natural for me to join Dalhousie University because it's within my home in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And I did the typical five-year program, uh, which is typical if you want to do co-op in, uh, in Canada as well. And it was in structural engineering. And then after that, after the five years and I graduated and I, and I graduated actually during COVID, which was so surreal, actually May, 2020. And then from there, I honestly, like, honestly, I really wanted to continue on. Like I didn't feel I was suffice with the knowledge that I got, I guess, from my undergrad. So I did my undergrad with co-op, but I still wanted to, you know, really specialize into something more specific because I wasn't too sure like what path I wanted to go through, you know, because obviously what, with a, you know, civil engineering degree, you know, you have a lot of options, whether you really want to do municipal or structural, you want to be a designer or a consultant. So I really was not sure actually what path I wanted to go through. Uh, but, you know, I think by getting a master's and uh, through my work experience, which we can definitely talk about afterwards, I really was so intrigued by bridges and bridge engineering in general. Um, so that kind of led the path to my master of applied science, which is a two year program. And then actually, especially to why this, why today is very special to me is today is when I officially graduated with my MASC and it was approved. So yes, I'm so happy. Such a rewarding journey, but I'm happy it's over. <laughs> and I'm actually moving um, with, you know, the end of my Master of Applied Science. I'm moving to Chicago, Illinois, and I'm also an EIT, obviously registered in the province of Nova Scotia. So I'm still trying to figure out this kind of transition of how I can register in another uh, country and another state coming from Canada. And I definitely want to talk about the EIT program within this podcast, podcast here today. But with my move uh, to Chicago, I want to kind of thank the American Concrete Institute because I think my involvement in ACI really led the path uh, to where I am here today and the job that I secured. So I definitely want to know, get to know you more in, in the sense of how you got involved with ACI as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for me, my first time where I had any influence from ACI was throughout my undergrad. So I graduated from high school here in Winnipeg and then followed on with, at the University of Manitoba for undergrad and then similarly continued on for grad studies at the University of Manitoba as well. So during my undergraduate uh, degree, I got involved with the ACI Manitoba chapter, which hosts a number of events and fields a bunch of teams for, for the ACI competitions, which you'll see at any of the, uh, the, comp at the conferences, which is great. And then carrying on after undergrad, I had a lot of influence from, from one of my work mentors, David Amorum, who had actually previously won one of the ACI fellowships. So he was really encouraging me to apply for this big ACI international, which I wasn't very familiar with at the time, uh, to try and apply with my work and school experience. And me thinking somebody from Canada, so doubtful that I'd ever 
be able to get one of these prestigious awards, went through the interview process during COVID and ended up getting one, which has really kind of springboarded my career with ACI and kind of my involvement. So now I've had the opportunity to attend a number of the conferences, which is where Faraj and I have met and talked both in Orlando and Dallas, which was great. And then I've continued on as well with both the academic committees and I'm also on the board of my professional chapter here in ACI Manitoba, which does a ton of different events. We host usually much monthly dinner meetings to have special topics related to concrete. And then we do some other extracurricular activities like a golf tournament. And we're having our first curling bonds feel, which I've never done, never curled before, but more of a hockey guy myself, but it should be interesting. But it's just great to get that collaboration with other people from industry. So ACI has really helped me build those ties, which I found has really helped my professional development. Uh, passing it back to you there, Faraj, how did you get involved with ACI? Absolutely, sure. I mean, that's a great story. That was, I think, the first time I heard that story, because I know we met personally um, in Orlando and then obviously in Dallas. And I'm so happy to, every time I kind of go to these conferences, coming from Canada, I want to meet other Canadian colleagues. That's something I will ask you later on, is that how can we kind of, you know, encourage other Canadian students to get involved? So I know you said, you know, you got involved with the student chapter in Manitoba, and, you know, within your university. Because that was one thing from my end and how I kind of got involved is that initially there was no student chapter in Nova Scotia. The only student chapter this far east, I guess, here in Canada was in Montreal and Sherbrooke. But otherwise, there was nothing in the Atlantic provinces. But my, I guess now my previous uh, academic supervisor now, um, he was very into ACI and he actually brought this topic to me when I was in third year of mechanics and material within his class in undergrad. And he actually brought it up um, in his lecture saying like, hey, is anybody in wanting to kind of get involved in ACI. And like you said, I never knew about ACI. Like, you know, it's obviously with the American in it, you just don't know. But then when I did some more research onto it, I was like, wow, like some, you know, doors could open here from all the mentorship you could, you know, obtain and all and what they have to offer. Even on the website of, you know, there's journals they have that you can, you know, you can publish and all that. But really I was like, okay, I really want to get involved, but there was no path to get involved in a way at in Dalhousie University. So I kind of brought it up with my supervisor at the time. And he was like, you know, why don't you form your own? And I was like, okay, we'll try that. But uh, so I'm like, I'll, you know, he's like, find some couple of students and create your own chapter, which I did. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. It was a very, very rigorous kind of path to even like when, you know, kind of, I want to use this analogy of like when you're trying to, let's say, pave a road and you just have forest in front of you, like we, you have to grub and clear and we weren't even at that stage yet. So He's like, you know what, try your best and just, you know, have at it. And I tried and, you know, you have to get the necessary approvals from ASA International and obviously from the local chapter as well, which I'm very happy to hear that you're also a member of the board of directors in Manitoba, because now I am also involved uh, with the board of directors in the Atlantic provinces, um, which is kind of an exciting, you know, series of events that happened. But after, you know, getting all the necessary approvals, we started to get involved in those student competitions, which I thought were a blast. Our first one, which I liked so much, I think is, will still remain to be my favorite, was the one in Quebec City, uh, March 2019 in Quebec City. It was on our home turf, you could say, give or take. And, you know, most of us have all gone to Montreal or Quebec City back, you know, whether in high school or, you know, with family visits and whatnot. So it was good to kind of go somewhere nearby. It was only like an hour and a half plane ride. And we actually went there and we were, so, even though it was, you know, negative 20 there, but we had a blast and we competed in the Eco Concrete competition getting to know the the young professionals there people you know people from industry consultants contractors other professors we really kind of thought you know we really got the sense of this is the right path for us in the sense that this play you know this organization can really open doors for us if you really you know invest into whatever you know works for you so from my end i was like you know from a student chapter perspective i really wanted to continue on you know attending the those six month conventions because I think it's very unique to ACI like I guess from the Canadian perspective I've attended CSCE Canadian Society for Civil Engineer Co conventions and they're once a year and some of our bridge conventions are every four years so it's kind of exciting in a way that you're meeting every six months and you're seeing people that you want to see every six months so I like that and you know you get to travel and whatnot so we were like you know what we wanted to continue and we did continue with um, going to Cincinnati and we compete in that competition I think that you know that kind of you know, jump-started my 
in a way career with ACI and my involvement with ACI because we kept on you know wanting to do those student competitions because you're competing with uh, these different international teams. But then obviously when COVID hit, we still wanted to maintain um, you know, our student chapter, but it was difficult to say the least. So I definitely want to know your thoughts. Like, was it difficult during COVID to kind of get people together? Like, how are you, you know, I wasn't sure at that time, were you still in university maybe in 2020 or 2021 ish? Or were yeah, you? Yeah. So by uh, the time, by the time COVID was picking up there, I had completed my undergrad and I had already started off with the professional chapter. And so there we had a lot of challenges. So generally we have our monthly meetings in person. And so of course that was completely canceled during COVID. So what we had to do is we had to adapt. We moved to online webinars. So we would still have our speaker come once per month, except it will be in a virtual setting, which worked out okay. You still get to field questions and have a little bit of collaboration, but you really lose those face-to-face -face interactions and kind of networking during, during the dinners, which was unfortunate. What uh, was really interesting was the spring ACI convention in Orlando. I got to attend the round table on behalf of, of the Manitoba chapter, which for those who aren't familiar with the ACI round table, that usually they send one delegate from all of the larger chapters in the States and you get together, discuss about what you're doing, what's working, not what's not working, what kind of roles you've had to uh, handle those changes from COVID. And it was super interesting to hear the different perspectives that everybody had, because I think generally up here in Canada, things were pretty conservative with shutdowns. And then there, I, there was one person from Texas where it's like, oh, we never changed a thing. I'm like, oh, that's great. <laughs> that makes things a lot easier. But depending where you looked across the States, there was a lot of different perspectives and methods, the way they handled the shutdowns. People generally found that the webinars were a good way to keep up engagement. They tried to increase doing their newsletters, email communications to try to keep people involved uh, during that period. And then how you make that transition back to in-person events. So we had our first dinner meeting in person since COVID started like way back in 2020, our first in-person dinner meeting was this past in November, it was our first time and we had great uptake great registration, lots of people came and it was very successful. So we're planning to do those moving forward with a bit of a hybrid approach. So you can still log into the webinar if you're not able to make it because of maybe you're on a, pro a rural project or something, there's some other situation where you can't come in person, but we found that that's been very effective. Um, another thing I really wanted to ask you here, Faraj, since we're both both bridge guys here is, yes. why, why, did you, why did you land in bridges? What kind of led you down that route path? That's an excellent question. So actually when I finished my undergrad, so I knew that I was going to do a master's of applied science, but I definitely wanted to get some work experience. And this was like right when COVID hit, but thankfully I actually got a position um, with the Nova Scotia Department of Transportation at the time. So May, 2020, I was very fortunate to join them. And initially I was supposed to be with their highway crew, but just kind of getting a feel for the different positions. I actually told um, my immediate supervisor at the time, I really want to get involved with the bridge crew. Like it was just something that I, you know, I saw what they were doing and the projects they were kind of, you know, encountering. I'm like, I, can I, is there a way that I can transition into, you know, the bridge crew or bridge team in general? And, you know, they were a little hesitant first, but I'm like, you know, obviously as an EIT, cause I did register when I graduated, I felt like this would be the best path for me. Cause I was just kind of intrigued by bridges. And they're like, well, you know what? There is a position available, a casual position for, um, you to kind of during the summer of 2020 to join the uh, bridge crew because they were in shortage of staff obviously due to COVID and they have a lot obviously due to the federal stimulus money that came in I recall probably went through all, all to, to all provinces really so we got a good chunk of that and it really opened up a lot of projects that uh, we could kind of delve into so in terms of bridge rehab all bridges that were kind of in bad shape had the money now to kind of do the necessary maintenance and rehabilitation so I got involved with that and I loved it. I just truly loved it. And I continued on with them. So my supervisor at the Central Bridge uh, Division with the Nova Scotia Department of Transportation became my mentor uh, for the EIT program, which we can definitely talk about later. Because I know even from my experience, like the EIT program was such a foreign concept. Like they kind of introduced it in first year of engineering and then they kind of forgot about it. So I definitely want to get your thoughts on that later. But to go back to the bridge topic, I think just in getting involved with the bridge team, I just loved it so much, specifically bridge rehab. Like I know there's a lot of people that love bridge design. I really loved bridge maintenance and rehab and kind of working with the contractors and making things work when you really have nothing. Like you're talking about bridge that were built in the 60s and the 70s. And yeah, sure, there are some drawings, but 
Um, and by the way, obviously the, the drawings back then were in Imperial before Canada moved to metric, which I'm actually happy for. But now since I'm moving to the US, I have to get used to and accustomed to the, the Imperial system. So it's good to have both actually, which is an advantage to kind of know both. Because when I got interviewed for my position, they love, they're like, oh, you're, you're, like, you're a metric guy. So that was a, <laughs> a, 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 a really, they were like, oh, because the thing is they had a Canadian individual in their team in Chicago, but they, he left actually to go to, uh, to Florida. It was a nice warm state. I was like, eh, don't worry. I'm used to the cold. And they're like, perfect. We need a metric guy. And I'm like, awesome. I know both. I know both Met Imperial and metric. Um, so it really works out in the bridge world because I heard even, which I actually did not know, that in the U.S. there was actually a time period, believe it or not, I think it was in 2006 or late 2000s, where the FHWA required that drawings were to be in metric for a couple of years. Really? I know. I was shocked to hear that. I'm like, that's excellent. And they're like, but then a couple of years later, everyone, you know, really complained. And then they went back to Imperial. <laughs> and I laughed. I was like, well, see, that's one of my advantages here coming from Canada, which I really want to kind of highlight is that there's so many advantages for people, you know, to get involved in ACI from Canada. Because I feel there's always a little struggle, obviously, with people wanting to get involved. But I was like, look at the opportunities that I've received. And I think you've touched on that, too, in terms of the opportunities and, and scholarships and from the foundation. Like, that's awesome. But I think from my, you know, immediate work experience to answer your question, uh, you know, dealing with bridges and dealing with bridge contractors, I stayed with the department for two years uh, until September of 2022. And my master's of applied science was really in on bridge rehabilitation that I just defended. So I think, you know, why I really appreciate work experiences, because I think that's where you really see if you really like to be in the field, this, you know, you get to see what kind of you know, the topic that you really want to get involved with more. So I think my little niche was just bridge rehab. And I enjoyed my thesis and I enjoyed my work. And now moving forward, I'll be, you know, going to Chicago and I'll be a bridge engineering associate there. So I think, all, you know, I guess starting from undergrad, not knowing what I wanted to go into, but then going into the field and seeing the opportunities that, that are available for bridge rehab, that's, I think that was the path. And I'm so happy that I selected this path. So on that note, I want to know how you got involved in the bridge industry. And, you know, mm -hmm. I want, would you call yourself a bridge engineer? I would. Like, technically, my title would be structural EIT because I'll, mm -hmm. I'll dabble with a few projects outside of the bridge world. But my core, my core services I would do for work generally goes around preliminary design, detailed design, contract admin, contract observation. Those are, those are kind of the day-to-day -day tasks I would be involved with the most. And yeah, like what, one thing you're mentioning, which really hits home is I found what was valuable for me going through graduate studies was, was working part-time throughout because I found you were able to kind of integrate the two and it kind of gives a lot of meaning to the research that you're conducting. So I'm definitely more on like the analysis and design bucket where you said you're on the, on the rehab side of things. They're, they're the same, but different slightly, but I, I really like doing design. So I can go to work, do a detailed design for a steel or concrete bridge, and then I can go to my master's research, which focuses on strut and time modeling with GFR, GFRP. And then I can kind of understand how me developing these ACI code provisions can then be applied in the future by an engineer like me, who is going to actually put these into practice and design structures. So, so I found working was just a great way to integrate the two. And what, what really landed me in bridges. So going into undergrad, I had a good sense that I wanted to, but engineering was a no brainer, love physics, love chemistry. I knew that's where I was going. And then once I got into civil, more related, it was really the undergrad teams that kind of pushed me towards bridges. I was on uh, the steel bridge competition. I don't know if you guys do that out east, but it, it's one of the CSC competitions that we were involved with. So I did three years in it. First, we started in the Midwest Conference of the States. And then after that, we transitioned to the Canadian competition. But just going from doing a STAD model that you might do for class, maybe you have to do analysis, mm -hmm. but then I prepare that STAD model and then we send it to the fabricator, we do all the drafting, and then we actually get the, the, the steel bridge to build. It kind of has that tangible application of what you're doing actually in practice. So I found that was very rewarding. And then just in general, when you're talking about bridge structures, there's such a broad range of the complexity you can have for bridges. Like here in Manitoba, we have second class structures, we call them, which is like your regular uh, precast, pre-stressed channel culvert bridge or channel girder bridge. So it's just cookie cutter, three span or two span. Here's your drawing package placed in the location and then it can span to up to the most complex of bridges you can get suspension you can get cable stay you can get cantilever trusses there's such a wide range of projects you can work on in bridges so I find that's really motivating because there's always so much different to learn about all the different structure types 
Uh, one thing you mentioned there, which I'd like to dive in a little bit more, is, is you mentioned the FHWA and how what, how that contributes towards infrastructure in the States. Of course, here in Canada, we don't have that. It doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. So, so right. tell, me, tell me a little bit of how those two differ. That's a very good question. A topic to kind of delve into is because that was one question I was asked continuously because obviously when I working for, you know, the, the government, you know, for as a DOT employee, they were asking me from a Canadian perspective, who is your federal oversight? And I was like, we don't really have a federal oversight in terms of provincial DOTs kind of in Canada, every province and territory in, in a way would kind of can do what they want to do in the sense that they kind of create their own bridge asset program can create their own rehabilitation and maintenance program. And even in terms of funding, which is a huge thing, it's based on provincial tax dollars. And there's no federal, uh, let's say for, per se, there's no federal funding coming into, you know, our provincial highways and bridges. And there's no federal document, like for the US that I, which I think I, I would hope that we can implement in, in Canada really, is have an FHW or kind of a federal guideline, which kind of each province can kind of refer to. And the reason why I asked that, because like, there's one thing I wanted to ask in terms of, you know, in Nova Scotia, what we're trying to create right now within the DOT, even though I have, I have left, is create our own kind of approved products list. Because if you look in different provinces in Canada, some do have their own, you know, provincial list. And I mean, obviously in the States, they have some DOTs have their own, but all of them do have a list where for us, some do, some don't. And if you look at, for example, Manitoba, they have their own list. Alberta has another, Vancouver, you know, sorry, BC has another and Nova Scotia doesn't have one. And we're trying to kind of create one. So I think it would have been great. And I think and I was really kind of getting these conversations going with our directors in our provincial DOT saying it would be really, I know, obviously it's a, it would be a system change. Like obviously for Canada, there is no federal oversight and no federal funding, but that would be definitely needed and definitely welcomed because, you know, it'd be great to have that in terms of how can we adopt new guidance like, sure, you can, like, for example, right now, our popular guidance is kind of referring to Alberta. I think they're one of the strictest and one of the best. So we kind of refer to them for a lot of things. And it does work out. And why I think we refer to Alberta so much is because locally in Nova Scotia, a lot of our kind of contractors in general have worked out west. Because mm-hmm. during that kind of the oil rush and over there, a lot of them were kind of these rotational workers that would go get experience, get necessary cash and come back home. So it was kind of in a way good that we can kind of harness their potential and harness their experience because they got out there here in the Atlantic provinces saying, okay, we know that they're familiar with the guidance and the regulations in Alberta. So why not adopt that here? You know, and it kind of is working well. I mean, it definitely is a long path to kind of get where we need to get to, but I do would like, or I guess I I personally would like to see a a system in place where there is federal oversight, federal guidance, and then each province can refer to that. And there's less of, you know, uh, you know, discrepancies between the provinces and maybe more, you know, more things that we can kind of connect on together. And I think that was, that would be more important, but who knows, obviously the big guys make those calls, but I definitely Mm -hmm. want to see in your perspective, what are your thoughts on maybe from Manitoba's perspective? Um, yeah you know. yeah I, I find it super interesting like Manitoba infrastructure like you were mentioning in the city of Winnipeg have their own approved products list which is an amazing tool you can open it up and see if I want to use a high strength grout or I'm looking for an epoxy or a certain bearing bearing Correct. like there's all it, it kind of gets you gets the ball rolling before you get too far into design so it really helps but here very often we refer to MTO so for Ministry of Transportation Ontario and I find mm-hmm. it super interesting which <laughs> provinces reference others so, for example, I've been involved with our bridge inspections uh, uh, for the province. Usually every summer we do them. And so we use the OSIM inspection guide, the Ontario Structures Inspection Manual. So one of the larger provinces that has lots of funding, so say Ontario, for example, puts all the resources into develop, developing these documents that then us as an adjacent uh, provin- province in Manitoba, we have our own revisions, so we take OSIM, apply a couple of changes on how we quantify deterioration and cater towards Manitoba, and then we essentially use that that manual verbatim. And so now in our in our office, we also do lots of northern work, so we do some projects for GNWT for for Northwest Territories as well as Nunavut, and they only reference a dot. They only use Alberta Department of Transportation, so. Like we're referencing Ontario, northern provinces are referencing Alberta, and it's kind of bounces all over. And I've been on a couple of projects that have referenced some of the BC docs. They have a lot of, of documents developed 
but it, it is really interesting in Canada because we don't have that central FHWA authority, which has that umbrella over all of the all of the provinces, kind of unifying those design guidelines, provisions, recommendations. Um, which I think would to, be great. I, I think it would help for sure. Like I know we have Transport Canada, but they're more involved with kind of monitoring and assessment of transportation systems. They're not really analogous to FHWA, and really Correct. the. If the funding structure I find has has a pretty big impact. Like there's always an ongoing joke in Manitoba. If you drive south on Highway 75, which takes you into North Dakota, you're driving on on the highway in Canada and you're going boo 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 over all the concrete mm -hmm. joints. It's a terrible road. And then you go over the border and it's just like driving on glass. The asphalt is perfect. There's no like longitudinal gradient. It's just amazing. So it's like you really can tell when you have that F FHWA funding going into the interstate to manage all that infrastructure so it's, it's a different system I, for sure you know if you're from a material i guess from material supplier side because i actually met a couple of individuals from sika and from basf and a couple of regional suppliers and they're like sometimes it's even difficult from for their perspective because like in quebec they have their own specialized list you know for grouts and epoxies and whatnot but then if you go let's say to nova scotia it's a little different new brunswick's a bit different and then bc there's, it's a bit different too so it's kind of which is so weird. How can you use, you know, the same, let's say high strength growth in Quebec with kind of similar environments per, per se to another mm -hmm. province, but it's not, you know, it's rejected there. Cause even we have this issue in Nova Scotia where it's kind of up to the engineer to kind of decide on certain products. So it's weird how, and I hear this from contractors all the time where they're like, well, down in this city, they allowed us to use this grout or this epoxy or this bearing pad or this, you know, joints. Why can't we use this here? I'm like, that's an excellent question. And they get frustrated. So I think when you have this unified, you know, federal standard or, you know, guidance, then everybody can refer to that and there's less of this ambiguity. And then it helps, you know, engineers, obviously, it helps contractors so they don't get frustrated. And even material suppliers, they're like, it's, it's better business for them. That yes, I can actually pump this out more in all provinces rather than just in specific provinces. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, and another thing, like the way the provincial governments are empowered to have that decision making ability, what's super interesting, I know we were talking at one of the conferences, is is Manitoba infrastructure uses Ashto for the bridge design, where meanwhile the city of Winnipeg uses CSA S6, CHBDC, the, the bridge design code. So essentially all of Canada is using CSA. And then the province, since they have that decision making ability, they don't have that central Canadian oversight, decides to use Ashto, which is good for me. I find it like it gives me the diverse perspectives to know both codes, but it's just a very obscure situation where it's not unified at all. Like if I'm designing a bridge that's one kilometer over that passes the border, I'm using CSA if it's on this side of using Ashto, even though it's the same country and what, and it's a Canadian standard, which is really interesting. And even if you pull a tender of specifications, for example, you'll look at what's included there as references and sometimes they contradict themselves. So it's, <laughs> it can really require a lot of, a lot of judgment from the engineers when you're trying to a contract or request in a, uh, an equivalent product and then it's accepted by this province but it's not accepted by this province it's on this approved products list it's not on this approved products list meets the criteria of aci but it doesn't meet the cri criteria of csa a23 is that mm -hmm. really acceptable so it can become a an interesting situation to handle correct because it's like it really leaves the individual engineer to decide certain things i was like well at the end of the day who am i like it's good to kind of have a whole panel of people to decide, you know, certain acceptance criteria and this and that. But sometimes when it leaves it to one person, it's like, I guess, why not? Like you, I mean, because personally I've seen, you know, contractors submit requests for an equivalent product list of, you know, certain products. And I was like, okay. And then we look at what they have to offer in terms of, you know, let's say amount of Coulombs passing for a certain, uh, you know, cementitious product. And I'm like, okay, this makes sense to me that another engineer is like, well, this doesn't really meet CSA. But I'm like, well, it meets ASI, ACI. They're like, well, and I'm like, it really is kind of so funny. Like it really, but the thing is, it's good to have these conversations, which I think is very important. And I want to kind of tie it into how, why I want more kind of young professionals from Canada to get involved with ACI. Because it's actually an advantage for Canadians to know both. Because I found Absolutely. from my, you know, from my perspective, you know, getting a job in the US, it was good to have my knowledge about US system guidelines and whatnot, and obviously Canada. And like you said, personally, I, this was actually new to me. I didn't know Manitoba designed to ashto that's actually news to me and not to csa s619 or which would be the current code so uh, i think getting you know getting involved with aci definitely opens doors i think we've kind of reinforced that fact but i guess going back to initial question i want to kind of get involved with because i know obviously both of us are registered eits mm -hmm. uh, in our respective provinces and uh, but i want to really get to know how 
you got to know about the EIT program and where it really started and your thoughts on it too as well. Yeah, I had a similar experience to you through undergrad and we have a design process and engineering first year, first year course that introduces the EIT program, says that this is our governing body, which is EGM Engineers Geoscientists Manitoba. And they encourage you to register as a student. And then hopefully that follows along for you going into the EIT and PNG process. But many people, you're so early on in, in your undergraduate career, you're worried about all your introductory engineering courses. You're not really thinking ahead as much about when am I going to get my license? So for me, it kind of fell off after that. And then it wasn't until later in my undergrad when I looked further into the program, tried to see what was going on with there, what kind of sort of requirements was going to be there for me to get my, li my license. And then now the situation I'm in here now is, is EGM recently underwent a uh, change in the way they qualify their PNGs. So typically it was a time-based system where you report on your work experience, you get sign off from your advisors and mentors, and that's how you get your four years of experience and then you get your PNG. So now Manitoba has transferred over to a competency-based system. Mm -hmm. So essentially the, the intent of it is to be a more efficient streamlined process so there is no time-based requirement. So in theory, if you had graduated today, tomorrow you could get your seal. If you had completed all your reports and checked off all these competencies, now under normal scenarios, you won't have enough competencies gained because you don't have that work experience. So that's likely not going to happen, but it more changes the time horizon from four years to two to three years if you do check up uh, that experience. And so I, I had a couple of them noted down here. There's the competencies are technical competence, communication, project and financial management, team effectiveness, professional accountability, social, economic, environmental, and sustainability, and then continuing development. So what you essentially have to do is provide uh, con concrete examples, concrete work examples <laughs> that check off each of these Love competencies. The yeah, <laughs> unintentional. And then they get validated. And then as long as you check all these different boxes, you can get your license. So it really is a, a transition that I'm trying to understand, see where I'm weak, which areas do I need to focus on, and go from there. So we do still have, uh, we have the ABC test, the Axe Bylaws Codes test. We have the NPPE, which I'm sure you've probably done the National uh, Professional Practice Exam, which is another ethics test. But then after that, we're done. There is no PE, there is no SE, there's no technical <laughs> base towards getting our license, which is super fascinating from talking to students and, and young professionals at the ACI uh, conferences is because they have these technical components to getting their license, which isn't here at all. So. Uh, I want to hear kind of where you are along that process of getting your EIT and how is that impacted from you now going mm -hmm. from Canada to the States? Are you still going to get your license in Canada? Are you only going to focus on getting it in Illinois, in the States? Is it just for Illinois by state? I'm not very familiar with the process. So, Sure. That's actually a great kind of point to go into is that so similar to you in terms of my EIT program is first year of, univers of my undergrad, someone came from the Association of Professional Engineers of Nova Scotia and talked about the EIT program and, and, and licensing and the PNG program. But then, like you said, we kind of really focused on our school and we we're like, this is four years or five years away. And then no one, you know, really talked about it. Like, honestly, it was just, it was literally the first course we had in the first year of undergrad that they kind of brought a panel of people and talked about it. And then they, they went, they went away. And then most people were kind of, as soon as third or fourth year hit, they're like, what do we do? Like, we really want to, you know, get more experience. You know, we want to kind of get more you know, information on this program since, you know, we want to become professional engineers as we graduate. But I think, you know, tying this into co-op was really important because once we went into the industry within our school period, we, we got to kind of pick, you know, the brains of, you know, people who are in industry and they told us more about the EIT program, which I appreciated because I didn't even know at the time that I needed a mentor to kind of to mentor you through the four years and to sign off on documents. So I think from you know, province, the province of Nova Scotia perspective, we're still on the, uh, on the old system where it's still the required four years. And um, every six months you submit journal entries and your mentor has to review them, sign them. And then once your four years has elapsed of, you know, having your necessary technical uh, field or technical experience per se, you can then proceed to kind of do the national practice exam, which is an ethics-based exam. That's a very important, you know, really, really, I want to highlight this is it's pretty much an ethics exam and not a technical, there's no technical components. You know, we're not really asking about the mechanics of materials if you're doing civil or different questions, whether it's like, you know, or power questions and or transistors and electrical, for, for example. But um, my transition, I, I, you know, initially I didn't know that I was going to go to the U.S. So obviously 
I continued with the Canadian EIT program. And I wanted to ask you as well about the EIT program. Is is it similar in Manitoba where your master's degree, I know it's a two-year program. Is that counted towards your EIT hours or no? Because for us, that yeah. two-year uh, master's is only one year of EIT years. Is that similar yeah, to so you guys too? We're in the same boat right now. My master's will count as one year towards my, t if it was the time-based system. So for example, if I had already, if I was partway through my reporting and I was trying to claim the four years on the old system, it would count as one year, which is a change because I was talking with people at work who, who have their master's. It used to be valued at two years. So if you did a two-year master's, you get two years towards your PNG, which seems great. And so it was the same thing for PhD. PhD used to be four years. You could essentially do your PhD and then get your PNG. And now PhD has dropped down to two years towards your your license, but now on the competency-based system, you essentially gain all that knowledge and examples from your master's and you just have to apply them to the correct competencies. The time doesn't really factor in, which is interesting. I, in a way, I do like that. I wish we can get that involved in other provinces, but I guess moving to go back to your question, I still will, I will be maintaining my registration in, in Nova Scotia because who knows, I might come back home, but I think it might be easier for me going to the U.S. So it was helpful in terms of getting my visa. So obviously I would need a work visa to go to the U.S. And having my registration as an EIT significantly helped me to kind of go into the U.S. for specific visa status. Uh, and obviously I'm not a, you know, a lawyer to kind of talk about legal issues here, but there's definitely benefits to registering as an EIT here in Canada. But I think to transfer over, I think it's easier for me to kind of continue my four years in Canada get my PNG and then I can do a technical exam when I go to uh, Illinois because it is state-based and I'll talk about that because so when I go to Illinois I think it'll be easier for me which I think I'm planning on doing regardless is that I'm going to maintain my IT status in Nova Scotia and get that done because I think I only have like eight months to go and then I then I can apply to get PNG so I'd rather get the PNG and then transfer that to a PE in the state of Illinois and do a technical exam and then I'm kind of registered in both states but to go back to your question as well, to kind of go into more detail, each state is different where some states require you to only get professional designation or a PE in the USP and equivalent in Canada, but to design certain buildings. So for example, if you want to be a structural designer to design hospitals or schools in certain states, you have to have your structural engineering designation. So both your PE and an SE. So in, in Illinois, you definitely need an SE. So it really depends on what you want to do. So I think because my scope of work is into not really bridge design, but more into bridge rehab and bridge consulting, I think it might be suffice with just uh, a PE designation. Because I think, and I was talking to my uh, my colleagues about this, like, yeah, PE designation definitely, co you know, definitely covers the majority of things you'll be doing. But if you're really going into the design side of things, especially the more stringent states, New York, Illinois, California, you would need that SA designation, which doesn't really exist in Canada because any P, P engine Canada can stamp a drawing to design a hospital or school. So I was kind of, I was like, oh, it's interesting kind of note that, but it definitely, it's a hurdle for me that I have to do a technical exam as I go to the US, but it'll be good to kind of, uh, you know, remind myself of the fundamentals. So I think in a way it forces someone to, you know, to recall and reminisce the old undergrad days and it's a good flashback into the fundamentals of engineering. And I think, uh, in a way, I think maybe it's important. I know if, you know, if I kind of recommend that Canada does that, people would kind of uprise like, no, an ethics exam is enough. But I think it would leave it up to the provinces. If each, you know, obviously if one province starts doing it, then it will be a domino effect. But it definitely is a hurdle. So definitely whoever is planning to go to the U.S. or vice versa, definitely look my recommendation is definitely look into each association of professional engineers websites, depending on, you know, which state you're going to or which province and see the requirements. Cause there's definitely different requirements within the nation and every or 50 states, there's 50 different requirements. And even in Canada, every province a little bit now has uh, some differences. Um, but I think, you know, for the EIT program, I think it's necessary. You know, I'm really happy that, you know, I got a mentor. Initially, I didn't see the advantage of getting a mentor, but I think when I was able to get those internships we talk about, that's where I saw the importance of uh, of mentorship. So, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I think mentorships are crucial. Just kind of to touch one more thing before we change topics here on if we tried to implement like a PE or SE exam here and had graduated engineers who are five to ten years out try to get them to do slope deflection or moment curvature by hand, I don't think. <laughs> 
I don't think the scores in those exams would be very, very good. Not to say that it's not important to learn that those structural analysis techniques and all that kind of nuts and bolts engineering you do in undergrad, but then once you start transitioning into industry and you start developing different ways of analysis and software and stuff like that, you can, you can lose some of those hand techniques pretty quick. So I always find it interesting when I hear people who are, are studying very hard to, for that PE exam or that SE exam, like mm -hmm. really got to get back into the technical side of things, which can be challenging when you've been in industry for a little bit. But going back to your question there, you're talking about uh, the roles of mentorship and how that, that, that impacts you. I think that's a good way to kind of approach wrapping up this conversation. For me personally, I found that mentorship has been crucial throughout both undergrad and then transitioning into industry. I've had a couple of people, key people through my academic career that have really helped, helped me do goal setting, help propel my career and try to figure out what's the best way to allocate my effort. Of course, there's always so many priorities going on in your life and you can only choose so many. What I've found is mentors can help you kind of narrow in on what is going to be the most effective in meeting your goals. For me personally, my advisor was critical. I had a really great relation with, relationship with him throughout my undergrad. I did an undergrad thesis with him and then continued on with master's with the same professor. So I found that that has really helped. And then moving on to the industry side of things, same thing. I've developed a network of people who I can always bounce ideas off of, kind of get an assessment on how my progress is going, where I should be going, uh, where I should be going in a five-year horizon, 10-year horizon. I feel like it's really important to discuss with mentors to help because they're the ones who have done it, right? They're the ones you're looking up towards and can give your insight on, on what they on what uh, what to do. Yeah. So now, Faraj, as you're taking that next next step in your career, you're starting to fill those shoes as the mentor. You're now you've passed that academic phase of your life. You're going into industry, and now there's going to be people going through school that are looking up to you. Is there any advice you would give to undergraduate or graduate students from your experience that you think it could help them? Whoa. Yes, that's an excellent question. It puts you on the spot because, like, it's so surreal that you're now becoming a young professional and are becoming a mentor for these young individuals that are coming through undergrad. And I think one thing that really resonates with me is that don't give up. I know it sounds very cliche, but really, if you have a gut feeling, follow your gut, follow your heart and don't give up because you will really go through the ringer in terms of undergrad, in terms of the courses. But even when you go to industry, like when I was first, my first job ever, I was put on the, I was put in the field with literally little support and little help. And you were dealing with these contractors that were coming to you since you were the engineer um, or so, you know, per se, and they were looking for answers and I didn't have those answers and they would kind of bombard you some more, you know, but obviously it's really keeping your composure and knowing that if you just kind of, you know, advocate for yourself, raise your voice and ask for the help that you need. So at the time I was like, Oh my God, I was so overwhelmed. And, what do they want from me? But if I really took the opportunity to really contact my supervisor, because he was only one phone call away or one text away. So we had that relationship. So ask for help when you, you know, when you need help, because otherwise your supervisor or mentor or even fellow colleagues won't know that you're in need of help and assistance. And I think engineering, is not a solo job. It's definitely a team effort. And it's a team of whether it's consultants or contractors, it's everybody coming to the table and working together and figuring out the best way possible to solve the problem. There's never one answer. There's definitely a plethora of answers out there, but it's working with the people you have, harnessing their potential, and then getting to the solution. So my best advice is don't give up and definitely advocate for yourself and trust your gut always. How about you? Those are, those are awesome ones there, Farage. I would reiterate a couple of them, like definitely don't be afraid to ask questions. Like, there are going to be times where you feel like you can't answer that question immediately. That's fine. It's better not to uh, make up an answer that could potentially lead somebody astray. It'd be better to just say, I don't know right now. I'll get back to you and then go find the necessary resources to come up with that proper ans answer. It's bad news doesn't age well. If you tell somebody <laughs> the wrong thing, it's going to make a lot more issues than if you just say, I'll get back to you. Uh, another thing I would say just more on the academic side of things would be to get involved, get in uh, do some extracurriculars, both technical groups. ACI is a fantastic one that has really benefited both of us. I find that that can really drive your professional development as well as your employment prospects. You can develop a good network, market yourself, and that, that can really give you benefits down the road. And then one final thing I would say, for engineering in general, it's important to recognize that your technical competency is not the all-encompassing definition of who you are as an engineer. Engineering is so much more than that. Like, when you're in undergrad, it's very difficult to get outside of the nuts and bolts. You spend so much time using your calculator and crunching numbers. 
But once you make that transition into industry, you find that engineering is so much more than that. That communication with people and, and all those other aspects is just as important as the technical, if not more. So I encourage you to, to keep open, be open-minded on that front. And with that, I'd like to say thanks again for joining us. And thanks to everybody for listening to this month's episode of Engineering Greatness. Join us each month as ACI brings together pairs of young professionals such as Faraj and myself in the concrete industry to engage in intimate conversations about their life and work. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And for more information on the American Concrete Institute, visit us online on concrete.org. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks.